you start? I think you say good evening. If everyone yeah. can take their seat. It's tough talking. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. If everybody could please take their seat, we'd like to get this forum started. Welcome to tonight's forum on regional school finance. My name is Dina Sullivan, and I am the chair of the Triton Regional School Committee. We are happy to have all of you here, and we encourage you to participate in tonight's discussion. If you would all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, welcome. As host of tonight's forum, I would like to introduce my colleagues on the school committee. Maureen Heffernan. Dan Belliante, Nerissa Wallen, please stand and be recognized, Tina Zorsis, Paul Lees, Linda Lipkowski, Deb Choate is guiding everybody in, our <laughs> stragglers, and Monique Grealish. I would also like to thank all of the town officials from the Triton community present here tonight, as well as those from the neighboring communities with regional districts. This forum should be the first step forward as we work together to address the unique financial issues we face as regional districts. Before I introduce our honored guests, I would like to review the format for tonight. We will begin with a presentation by our state auditor of the report, Supporting Students and Community Success, Updating the Structure and Finance of Massachusetts Regional School Districts. I would then like to give our state officials an opportunity to respond to the findings in the report first before the question and answer, answer session for the audience. I would like to begin with questions and comments from our town officials first. If you would like to address the panel, we ask that you state your name, hometown, and roll for the public record. Sign-in sheets are located at each of the microphones. When using the microphones, please keep it close when speaking. For the audience microphones, please tilt the microphone down towards you. We are honored to have here tonight the Massachusetts State Auditor, Suzanne Bump. Sworn into office in January 2011, Ms. Bump is the first female elected to this role in our state's history. She is a former state representative and state secretary of labor and workforce development. With her this evening is her division of local mandates director, Dr. Ben Tafoya. Also on the panel, we have our two state senators and three representatives who advocate for the Triton community at the state level. We have built a strong working relationship with our state legislative delegation sitting on stage tonight, and I want to personally and collectively thank them for their persistence in fighting for our communities. With us this evening, we have Senator Kathleen O'Connor-Ives, Massachusetts State Senator, 1st Essex District. Senator Bruce Tarr is coming. Uh, First Essex and Middlesex, Dis Middlesex districts. Representative Brad Hill, Mass State Representative, Fourth Essex District. Representative James Kelkors, Mass State Representative, First Essex District. And Representative Lenny Mira, Mass State Representative, Second Essex District. At this time, I would like to ask if there are any other state officials in the audience to please identify and introduce yourselves. It's hard to see. Do we have anybody? Could you please go to the microphone? Good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Searles. I work for State Representative Ted Spiliotis. Thank you for being here. Before we begin the formal presentation, I'd like to ask our superintendent, Brian Forgett, to provide a brief context for this discussion. <laughs> Mr. Forgett? 
that is not funny. <laughs> <laughs> it is so there are some people in the you. audience who know me. <laughs> Good evening. And thank you for coming this evening. In reviewing the agenda and focus for tonight, we agreed it made sense to provide a brief context for this discussion that Auditor Bump has so articulately laid out in her report. Those who know me will know that the greatest challenge in this task is indeed the concept of being brief. So I've scripted my remarks, which is a new for me. Uh, I guarantee I will not get on my soapbox this way. So in now in my 23rd year here in the district, prior to becoming superintendent, uh, in July of 2016, I served as the school business official for 11 years, so the concept of regional finance is near and dear to my heart. In the spirit of being brief, I'll provide a couple statistics that I believe accurately portray the problem. On the table when you walked in, there was a one-page document that looks like this, containing a bar graph depicting the last 15 years, 2002 through 2017. The graph shows the portion of our operating budget that is funded by Chapter 78 versus the portion funded by assessments to our member communities of Newbury, Rowley, and Salisbury. In 2002, Chapter 78 accounted for 34% of our total operating costs, while in 2017, that figure has dropped to close to 22%. With no other funding sources available and federal grants dwindling, that has resulted in the burden of our member towns growing from under 60% in 2002 to approaching 74% in 2017. In fiscal 2017, Triton received $324,000 less in Chapter 78 than we did in 2002. 15 years prior, not adjusted for inflation, $324,000 less 15 years later. Over the prior 15 years, 2002 through 2017, our operating expenses have grown roughly 51% over the 15-year period. Close to 30% of those costs have been driven by health care and special education costs. Due to the inadequacy of the Chapter 70 formula that I mentioned above, our 51% increase in our operating costs has yielded an increase of close to 82% in our collective assessments, uh, aggregate assessments rather, to our member towns. We are on a path towards bankrupting local communities that are part of, part of regional school districts ac across the Commonwealth. I could keep going, as you all know, with statistics, but I promised to be brief. This is as brief as I get. Uh, as outlined with the release of the governor's budget yesterday that included over $100 million in new spending in Chapter 78, Triton is slated for an increase of $48,000 in total. This perfectly illustrates that the solution is not merely about increasing chapter increase, increased funding for Chapter 70. While the Foundation Budget Review Commission, while the call by the Foundation Budget Review Commission for re increased funding because of health care and special education are real and evident, as I mentioned, it's about fixing a structural issue in the formula. Throwing new dollars into a broken formula does nothing but perpetuate the inequity. So I want to end with a thank you. We are lucky enough to have four of our five state legislators, the four sitting on the table or at the table already, uh, that are on the, the regional schools caucus for the state. I want to thank you all for your leadership and proactive push for the governor to include full reimbursement for regional transportation early on in the budget process. The governor's failure to do so in yesterday's release confirms the lack of understanding of the depth of the problem and the complexities of timing in regional school budget development. However, that does not diminish your attempts on our behalf, and we thank you. So with that, I would like to turn the microphone over to our state auditor, Suzanne Bump. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Superintendent, uh, and to all of you uh, here, and uh, especially my colleagues in, in state government. Uh, I want to just set the table for you a little bit, uh, explain what it is that we do, what led us to, uh, to do this report, and then in a very efficient division of labor, 
I'm going to turn it over to Ben to tell you all about the report. Um, so I think that you all appreciate that the role of the state auditor uh, in general is to assess the performance of state agencies, determine um, how they're spending their money and how well they're spending their money. But we also have this little division within the, uh, the office uh, called the Division of Local Mandates. Uh, as the name suggests, we, uh, we look at issues that are brought to us uh, by uh, municipalities, in some cases by members of the legislature, as uh, Representative Speliotis has, uh, has done, and ask us to undertake a legal analysis as well as a financial analysis and determine whether an obligation that the state has imposed upon municipalities is one that, according to a legal analysis, is one that the state government should be paying for rather than local property taxpayers. Uh, and so recent determinations have, uh, have for instance, uh, affected uh, the funding for uh, early voting in our statewide elections. But we also have another uh, role, and that is that we have the authority to undertake other kinds of research and studies uh, to look at burdens that otherwise municipalities are bearing that may not fit the legal definition of, uh, of unfunded mandate, but nonetheless cry out for state attention. And so uh, that's how it is that we came to do this, uh, this kind of, of work. A year or so ago, we published a report relative to water, sewer, and stormwater uh, infrastructure, which calculated the costs of improvements necessary to bring um, all of these kinds of municipal and regional facilities up to standards within 20 years, and that we pegged that cost at $18 billion. So you can see how much the legislature likes to hear um, from us issuing these reports. We have all kinds of ideas about how it is that the state government can be helping municipalities meet their obligations. In this particular instance, um, we undertook this uh, report for a reason that was actually, frankly, rather personal to me. Because until very recently, I was a resident of the town of Great Barrington, which is all the way out at exit one on the on the turnpike. You've probably never been there um, if you've ever indeed even heard of it. Um, but the reason um, that uh, that this became of interest to me is that uh, for years now uh, it seemed impossible to pick up the paper without reading of the difficulties that local school districts were having, and they're all regional school districts um, out in Berkshire County, um, were having meeting their, uh, their operating budgets, coming to agreement, figuring out how it was that the various communities were actually going to come up with their share, um, making horrible decisions about closing schools, naturally, um, and you can't believe the number of fights that there have been over closing one-room schoolhouses. Um, but, but then also looking at long-term how it is that you can uh, make the necessary improvements to the facilities uh, where these kids are going to schools. And school closures out there um, really have a tremendous impact on the quality of, of life for parents and children because we are talking about busing over uh, of transportation over ever increasing um, miles of, uh, of country road. And we have a declining population in, uh, in the Berkshires. And so therefore, uh, uh, while, while costs are increasing, um, if lucky, staying the same, uh, th there are fewer and fewer uh, families uh, to bear the, the burden. So it was that, um, it was that experience of, uh, of years of seeing uh, my colleagues, uh, you know, my neighbors uh, wrestling with this um, that caused me to turn to uh, Ben Tafoya, uh, Dr. Tafoya, who is the head of the Division of Local Mandates, um, and ask him if we might look at this. And to go a little bit deeper than most of the uh, recent looks at regional funding uh, uh, issues have gone. Um, I served, as you heard uh, in the introduction, for a number of years in the legislature. That goes back to the 80s. <laughs> we have never 
we've never funded regional school transportation to the extent that uh, that's required under the law. So I knew that that was going to be on the, on the list of any of the problems that got identified. But I really wanted to go more deeply and not just look um, at the annual funding issues, but also look long term at the structural issues and try to come up with a set of recommendations that might um, address some short term um, problems that we could identify, but also try to engage uh, the, uh, the, my colleagues in government uh, as well as you folks at the local, uh, local levels in discussions about the, the long-term structuring of regional school agreements and financing for regional schools. And so we produced a report that I think has been um, uh, really opened a lot of eyes on, uh, on Beacon Hill uh, and has generated uh, a good deal of discussion and I don't know if you thought you were coming to an informational meeting but this is a political meeting. Make no mistake about it. This is a political meeting. Um, you, you all have an interest in, uh, in understanding better the dynamics of this problem and contributing to the solutions and I do hope that this, um, that this report uh, continues to advance this, this uh, discussion of both short-term and long-term um, actions that are necessary. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Tafoya. Thank you. Thank you, Auditor. Um, and thank all of you for coming tonight. It's um, um, a bit overwhelming to see um, this turnout. Um, to the local officials sitting in the front row, I mentioned to a few of them that um, I did spend nine years as a member of the Board of Selectmen in my hometown of um, Reading, Mass. So I sort of feel your pain on both sides of the aisle here and, and understand the, um, the role and um, sat in front of many audiences this big talking about municipal issues there. But it's um, very gratifying to see um, so many members of the community come out tonight um, to discuss this issue with us. And um, I think to the auditor's point about um, the report, we spent um, quite a bit of time um, developing this material and I just want to talk for a couple of minutes about our methodology and then um, about what we found. Um, we went out and um, the first thing we did was to take a look at sort of the pre-existing literature and you may be surprised to hear that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in 2009 actually provided um, a very good report I thought uh, on challenges facing regional school districts. Um, the legislature um, produced one um, that was um, uh, published in 2011, which um, also, I think, contains some very valuable information that um, talked to some of the problems that we found as, as we talked to folks. But, you know, we went into the field six years later, um, and we started off talking to members of the legislature. Um, we engaged um, quite a bit with the statewide advocacy groups. Um, who look at public education in the state, so the Mass Association of School Committees, Mass Association of Regional Schools, um, and um, got feedback um, from organizations like that as to what they saw as the current landscape of issues um, facing regional schools. Um, and then we went and started talking to school superintendents in select districts, and from there they pointed us to other school superintendents in other districts. The focus of the report was on the 58 academic regional school districts um, in the state um, that represents about 170 communities in the Commonwealth. We didn't specifically look at issues regarding uh, vocational and technical um, school districts, but many of them are, are, are the same. Um, and we spent um, significant time um, talking to school business officers, members of regional school committees, um, town managers, town administrators, members of um, select boards in, in various places, uh, and then some citizen activists who had um, an interest um, in these issues. And um, the staff and I became convinced at the end that there was, in fact, um, a significant crisis facing our regional school districts in, in the Commonwealth. Uh, and that that crisis related to uh, a number of factors. Um, one is um, uh, demographics and enrollment. Um, as um, the auditor indicated, we have regional school districts throughout the Commonwealth. I should add at this point that not all of them, there are some um, that um, don't 
have the same problems as the majority of them um, do because they're um, just by historical circumstance um, in a better place in terms of money or whatever. Um, but and on the Cape, in Central Mass, up this way, in Western Mass, um, there has been a significant decline in enrollment um, in regional school districts. So we took a look at s certain statistics over a 10-year period. Um, I refreshed myself. They're published in the appendix of, of the report um, as to the regional districts around here. But fundamentally, regional school districts over the 10-year period saw a decline in enrollment of about 10 percent. Overall, um, enrollment in public schools in Massachusetts um, declined just a little bit over that period of time, it was about 1.8 percent. Um, there were significant increases in enrollment um, in charter schools and in vocational technical high schools um, over that period of time, and municipally based school districts saw a, sm a small decline. But the biggest decline by far was in regional school districts. And we've seen in some of the districts, um, as you may be aware, that those declines um, went far beyond 10 percent. There are some that saw declines as much as 25 percent. Uh, and as such, there's a great deal of difference in terms of enrollment among our regional school districts um, in the state. Um, so one of the districts we looked at quite um, on a detailed basis was the Berkshire Hills Regional School District the auditor talked about, which is in Western Mass. Um, they have an enrollment of about 1,300 students. Uh, we looked at the Wachusett School District in Central Mass, which is by far our largest regional school district in the Commonwealth with 7,000 students. And we also looked at the Groton Dunstable uh, Regional School District um, in the 495 area. Uh, and um, they had also seen a significant decline um, in enrollment over this period of time. Again, some of it relates to demographics. You know, Western Mass, the nature of the population is changing there. It's getting older. There are fewer um, school students. In some of the other areas, um, the challenges have come from um, parents making other choices for their um, children about educational opportunities that exist. And we think in part, or good part, that is driven by the resource shortage that, um, that our regional school districts face which then sort of compounds the problem um, of um, enrollment decline. Um, so as we talk to folks out there um, in the, um, the, the community, um, we also developed um, a statistical model and did a, a little bit of an analysis to see what kinds of economies of scale that um, we might recommend for regional school districts. And one of the things that we found is that there's real a significant difference in the expenditure per pupil um, that our regional school districts face depending on their size. It's a uh, set of issues that don't exist for our municipal school districts. The average regional school district in the Commonwealth has about 1,800 students. The average municipally based um, district in the Commonwealth has about twice that. Um, so um, regional school districts, if they're larger, can um, uh, benefit from um, increases in economies of scale. The smaller districts um, have a much higher per pupil um, expenditure level. So among those regional districts we looked at, we had Wachusett at about $12,000 per pupil for in-district services, uh, and somebody like Berkshire Hills or some of the other smaller districts in the western part of the state um, at $18,000, or $20,000 um, per student um, for in-district services. Um, as a result, uh, one of our main findings and recommendations is that the Commonwealth's regional school districts would benefit from further regionalization. Uh, and um, we would certainly want to encourage folks um, to think about ways that they can cooperate um, or, uh, as is going out on in Western Mass as we speak, um, serious discussions about further uh, regionalization. But when we talk to folks about this issue, um, we hear some uh, rather logical pushback um, on the issue. One is, we, you know, we live in Massachusetts, and our way is basically to grant um, local sovereignty um, over um, education and many other services to our cities and towns. And we've gone to, the, to our cities and towns periodically and said, um, hey, folks, some things might be a little more efficient if you did it on a cooperative basis, um, but we pretty much, with the exception of regional schools, ask people to come up with 
different kinds of ad hoc mechanisms to make that happen. Um, regional school districts have a specific kind of structure that, that communities have to go through um, in order to regionalize. But at base, what we're asking folks to do is to give up some local sovereignty to the regional entity um, in order to um, offer a better educational experience um, for the uh, students in their area. And what we heard from people throughout the state, and it really didn't matter which corner of the state we were talking to folks about, is a reluctance to do that because um, we think there aren't now significant incentives for folks to make that leap, to give up that measure of lo local sovereignty. And since ed reform passed in the early 90s, really the substantial um, dollar commitment that the state made to our regional school districts was on um, the uh, transportation reimbursement. Um, and that's um, a sort of a two-edged sword because, as you all know, regional school districts have a more strict requirement for providing transportation services um, to their students than municipally-based school districts do. And not only that, our regional school districts are, generally speaking, larger geographically. So they're incurring more expense in order to transport um, students uh, to, to their schools. So this regional um, uh, transportation reimbursement is very important um, for our regional school districts. And in fact, in talking to the three dozen or so folks that, um, that we interviewed in the course of doing the study, um, the regional school transportation reimbursement was the number one or number two problem that folks relayed to us um, in, in our discussions. Um, so, you know, we uh, make a very strong call in, in the report for this 100% reimbursement um, for regional school transportation is what it is um, stated in the law and what our regional school districts depend on. Um, they, uh, many of the uh, members of regional school committees relayed to us that um, they get pushback from their municipal officials um, during budget time because um, the municipal officials point to Boston and say, why aren't you getting the money uh, that um, you've been promised and that in generations past we've been told would be available to help fund uh, our um, educational services. Could I, could I interrupt you there and, and just see if I might ask the superintendent, so what, what is the experience in your, uh, in your district here been relative to school transportation costs? <laughs> she didn't ask me to be brief. Um, I'm on. Uh, in, in regards to costs over time or yeah. reimbursement? So it, we are, uh, we have trimmed back our, the number of runs as enrollment has dropped, but we're at this point running 24, looking for Michelle, she's nodding, yes, 24 runs, um, simply because of geography. Um, so we, you know, for us, a, a, an increase to 100% transportation reimbursement is to the tune of 320 some odd thousand dollars. Um, so annually, so it's significant, that one factor is a significant uh, increase for us. And that clearly is a challenge that is unique to the regional school districts because of the large distances, Correct. because of the obligation to provide door-to-door uh, -door, um, that, that other municipalities don't have. And one of the other things beyond the reimbursement level, uh, when we were looking at the uh, constrained options that municipalities have when, uh, and districts have when they are trying to secure uh, transportation services uh, is that you can't get people to bid on the contracts. Um, and so you don't really have a competitive bidding Correct. situation. There you're lucky in, in many instances, particularly on the Cape we were finding, they're lucky to get one bid and you're really over a barrel. Yeah. Um, you, they, you don't get to make many choices. And so considering that and, and where then what other solutions might there be one of the things that Ben turned over, um, turned up, was the fact that uh, by statute, uh, districts are precluded from working with their regional transportation authorities to provide uh, that transportation. And so, in addition to a recommendation to the legislature and to the governor for uh, for school uh, 
transportation reimbursement at 100% of costs. Um, we're also recommending um, that there be uh, further options to get that rid of that constraint because in some areas um, it is uh, th there is a, a benefit to the school district district as well as to the regional uh, transportation uh, agency yeah. in the area. Yeah. So those are two short-term things that we are pushing um, with the, uh, with, within the legislature right now. Thank you, Ben, for letting me interrupt. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, there's sort of one other point that I wanted to make on transportation costs, which is that their transportation costs for regional school district are only reimbursed in part. Um, what the um, reimbursement is based on is the cost of, of what we would refer to as regular day yellow bus transportation. There is also a significant cost incurred by all school districts in the Commonwealth, but particularly as well the regional school districts, which relate to special education transportation, both in district and out of district. None of those costs are included in the in the reimbursement um, amounts. Uh, so. Um, regional school districts, uh, you know, have some very significant challenges with respect to um, transportation. Um, sort of on this sort of t governance topic, we also recommend in the report that there should be um, greater availability of planning grants for those districts that are looking to work together for shared services or for um, further regionalization. Um, I know some of the folks um, I've heard from in recent days in Western Mass uh, are struggling a, a bit because they had applied for competitive grants from the state that, that were declined, so they're going to be sort of trying to work other channels um, in order to get those, um, those avenues um, uh, funded. Um, what, if I, shifting gears away from transportation um, for a moment, um, we also found that uh, the current sort of structures of regional school districts provide some roadblocks for things that um, folks would like to do. Uh, and um, in part that has to do with a budget system that's set up um, that causes some conflict to occur. I'm sure it doesn't happen here in Triton, but in other parts of the state, um, you know, there is um, significant conflict between the communities that are trying to cooperate within regional school districts. Uh, and um, between the um, school district and the municipalities. Uh, and we have in the report some detailed recommendations of things that um, we recommend that the Commonwealth think about um, in order to um, reduce um, those kinds of conflicts. Um, the di you know, districts here like Pentucket and Triton you know, are three community districts, but we have other um, districts throughout the state that have um, larger numbers of, of communities, um, they suffer um, because they have very difficult times getting budgets accepted. So Wachusett School District and uh, Central Mass is five communities. Um, three are always willing to accept the budget and the assessment. The other two never are. So four years in a row, they roll into the new fiscal year without um, a budget accepted. Um, by the required number of town meetings, and it's a scramble that's on to come to some kind of an agreement um, so budgets can be put in place. It's not very good for planning. Um, it's not very healthy for the, um, the educational mission that the um, school districts are trying to undertake. Uh, and with some of these discussions that we've seen in various parts of the state, I'm talking about combinations for efficiency purposes that would add any number more communities to regional school districts and we think that this sort of these current structures will hold up progress um, in those areas and we need to apply some creative thinking to sort of new forms of governance that might actually facilitate having regional school districts with 10, 11, 12 communities um, in them that um, uh, would allow people to um, work together in a better fashion. Uh, the um, uh, other things that, that we found is that um, in many regional school districts that the um, agreements um, aren't updated periodically and so we make a general recommendation to um, districts that they should put a process in place that every five years they should take a look at 
the regional agreements because a couple of districts have been caught short when they've had emergencies where they needed to do things like consider closing a school and that the regional agreement got in the way uh, and um, it winds up creating a lot of additional effort to make a decision that um, people um, had developed a, a, a consensus around. Um, the uh, superintendent mentioned the issue of the um, Foundation Budget Review Commission. Um, again, in talking to uh, regional schools throughout the Commonwealth, um, when asked what their major cost drivers were, you know, the answers are the same. It's those that were documented in the Foundation Budget Review Commission study um, related to special education costs, um, as well as um, the costs for compensation and, um, and benefits, and that the formula um, is way out of date, um, and that when you, we update the formula, it's going to require a significant higher level of investment uh, to um, uh, fulfill uh, the um, state aid um, requirement. Um, there are all, all kinds of other categories that, um, of state aid, that some of which we document in the report, um, where we don't reach 100%. For you folks, it's less of an issue, but um, McKinney-Vento homeless transportation is another category um, where um, we're not at 100%. We're recent years actually at 33%. We are concerned about that because the state funding in this area was an outgrowth of uh, a mandate determination that um, Auditor Bump made in 2011 and cost accounting that we did in 2012 uh, on, the, um, on the issue. So we like to take opportunities like this to remind folks about that, um, that kind of commitment. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons why you see the kinds of numbers that the superintendent talked about for, for local aid um, is because uh, of trying to struggle with uh, the, uh, uh, the current uh, Chapter 70 formula uh, and um, sort of changes that occur over time with uh, demographics um, in communities uh, that uh, result in many of our regional school districts, but by no means all, but many, um, having a minimum aid um, category where they're being held harmless um, because of the drops in enrollment uh, that um, where otherwise their state aid um, potentially could be even lower. Uh, so uh, that's an issue that um, advocates for regional school districts need to be sensitive to as the discussions continue uh, with respect to uh, the Foundation Budget um, Review Commission recommendations. And, and to that point, there is a piece of legislation um, that is sponsored by um, our acting Senate President, um, Senator Chandler, um, which would um, convene a, a special uh, Foundation Budget Review Commission just looking at issues um, related to uh, regional school districts. Um, finally, uh, back to a, sort of a financial issue. Um, there are various ways that money flows in and out of regional school districts based on um, choices that family makes make for um, the educational opportunities for their children. Um, so one um, source of that is school choice. Some districts do it, some districts don't. Um, but uh, the um, funding formula for that also has not been updated for many years. Um, and so districts are um, capped at a maximum of $5,000 that they receive um, per student who come into a district as a result of um, school choice. And we say in the report we wouldn't want to do anything that would encourage school districts to spend money on um, non-educational resources that would result in competitions, but um, we also understand that the per pupil expenditure um, for a student, um, even in a district with some excess capacity, um, does exceed $5,000 uh, everywhere in, um, in the Commonwealth. So we're concerned about that. Um, the uh, amount of money that school districts lose as a result of um, students going to charter schools is much higher than the school choice um, number, um, as is the number for students who, who go to vo te vocational technical um, high school um, is much higher. And so it, we just um, point out that there's this issue out there of different reimbursement levels or different cost levels for different kinds of choices, and that it might make sense for the Commonwealth to take a look at rationalizing this um, a bit um, to 
um, have these dollar numbers be a little bit more um, consistent and um, contemporary. Um, I can see a lot of expressions on people's faces out there that they may have um, questions. So, why don't just th thank you, thank you. Um, so, so uh, Ben just concluded um, by talking about some of the longer-term conversations that need to be had. Um, we've met naturally enough with the Department of um, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education about a number of. Uh, uh, of our findings and recommendations. I, and uh, I was actually encouraged, um, and I hope that, uh, that you and your various um, groups, whether it's school committees or, or, uh, or school superintendents, really do take up um, the uh, agency on a willingness to have conversation uh, and explore some, uh, some of these other um, funding funding issues, but the thing that was most interesting to me was the was the receptivity to having uh, conversations uh, that go to uh, how it is that communities uh, will share the costs of um, of of the district assessments, will or will deal with the question of district assessments. Um, as I alluded in the in the very beginning uh, to the situation out in uh, in Berkshire Hills. Uh, the, 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 the problems of getting to a budget and getting to uh, decisions about uh, to invest in modernization or, or renovation of the, of the uh, school were compounded by the fact that, uh, that the uh, relative wealth of the three communities in the, in the district um, was very different. Uh, and the, the two small communities were quite wealthy communities and could well afford as taxpayers uh, to, uh, to support uh, a brand new school. Uh, the largest community in the district uh, was the least uh, wealthy. Uh, it was sending more of the kids there. The burden was going to fall more heavily on them um, and they were the ones that kept putting their foot down and, and saying no for understandable reasons. Um, and, so, and so that really um, just calls up the question of whether there ought not be other models of that uh, and pilot programs that communities can come together and experiment with to find more equitable ways uh, to, uh, to meet the costs of the local share of, uh, of the cost of education in, uh, in regional schools. And uh, there are, uh, Ben has, has, has talked before about the fact that uh, he came from Pennsylvania. Uh, where they have a very different model uh, for uh, local, for the local portion funding of the regional schools. And there are models, different models all across the country um, that, that we you know, encourage you uh, to explore and to do so with members of the legislature as well as the, um, as well as the administration. Um, the, out in Berkshire County where they are thinking about making uh, a county wide district, and that's how many communities? 30? 30? 32. Yeah. 32 communities. They're, they're all struggling. They're all in, in 15 different So Berkshire schools. County has 15 um, school districts. They have some municipal base, but uh, many of them are regional, and they have about 14,000 students. So you can do the math, and it's not good. And so they're desperate for an alternative and, uh, and are talking with their legislature, uh, with legislators about um, authorization to conduct some pilots to test different, different models just to deal with that, um, the local, how to, how to uh, fairly apportion uh, the local share of the cost of regional uh, uh, schools. So just with that, uh, just underscore the fact that there are unique challenges that, that the report points out, unique challenges for regional uh, schools. All uh, your school uh, districts across the Commonwealth are feeling uh, just pressed in their budgets and they're always competing against public safety and, and public works programs. Uh, but the challenges for regional school districts really are greater. They are at a much more critical point um, than they are for, uh, for municipal uh, districts. Uh, we are 
happy that we have been able to contribute uh, in, in some ways to, uh, to shining a light on this and stimulating uh, conversation and we continue our work with the legislature and with the administration driving home these messages and uh, look forward to working with, with, more, um, with many of you uh, in, the, in the audience to see if we might find some relief so that kids in regional schools are not disadvantaged by the fact the mere fact that they're in regional school districts. So with that, we thank you. Thank you very much for having us here this evening. Thank you both for a very informative and important um, presentation tonight. At this point, I'd like to recognize that Senator Tarr has been able to join us tonight. Welcome. Since we've heard the presentation, I'd like to ask if our representatives or senators would like to make any comments. Mm -hmm. Please. Thank you very much, Auditor Bump. Thank you, Ben. I, I relish any opportunity to have the inadequate funding highlighted. So to have someone of the auditor's stature be able to decide that this is a priority and to dispatch your resources to closely examine it is extremely appreciated. Because it's very surprising, like it was said, so many communities, we're not talking about 10 cities or towns, so many communities are actually impacted with the regional situation. You would think that we could do better since 1945 I think when it was determined that it should be fully funded in terms of regional school transportation. And what Senator Tarr and I were just um, briefly uh, discussing is that we're all too familiar with how these issues are really all the same. If there are two columns and one is revenues, and we know that the budget is not fully funding the regional transportation issue, that's on the revenue side on our end. And then the costs are just always going to go up, really. I mean, there's never a situation where busing is less expensive or gas is cheaper or anything like that. So those costs are always going to go up. But the other side of the column, too, in, in fact, those costs need to be considered as well. So special education costs are only going up. And unfortunately, like this report highlights, the special education transportation costs are just as much a burden as the regional transportation costs because the regional schools aren't incentivized or benefit, but they're still a real cost. So in the legislature, and I'm certain my colleagues will, will focus on this as well, we, year in and year out, we file amendments to boost those numbers to try to hold everyone accountable to that promise. Folks were incentivized to regionalize. There has got to be some benefit. There shouldn't be only burdens. Now people have agreed to do it. And quite frankly, why would anyone regionalize anymore at this point? I don't see any incentives out there unless I missed them. Um, we're still trying to make up for decades of broken promises, let alone um, any consistent funding. If we could at least have consistency, let alone 100% uh, reimbursement, that would at least be good for planning purposes, and we can't promise that either. So uh, historically, over the past three budgets, it has gone down, but it's not because folks in the legislature aren't filing those amendments. We had in the Senate a successful amendment for a little over, I think it was one point to $5 million of a boost over the original Senate line item. So we have colleagues even beyond Bruce and ourselves that are in the Berkshires and in central Massachusetts that understand this pain as well. So it becomes something where all of those issues that all schools have plus the regional school issues, and the audit also points out we also have to uh, advocate for McKinney-Vento because when you have students who deserve to go to the districts that they want to go to, whether they're homeless or they're foster children or whatever those challenges are, then the districts shouldn't have on top of that obligation not enough funds. I mean, that is clearly an unfunded mandate that we need to continue to advocate for. So there's all these different siloed problems in terms of the costs, but like the auditor and Ben said, if we simply followed through on the promise as a baseline, then all the other things become less burdensome because the special education, not to crack, is a very controversial one because we want to provide resources, but the costs are so incredibly overwhelming. We also fight to have special education funding adequately funded as well. So I think that the best thing to do, and I was just mentioning at the onset of the program, is um, like Auditor Bump said, 
in the political sense, we need to organize. We need to continue to organize because we all see year in and year out that the squeaky wheel really does get the grease. And sometimes people's eyes glaze over in terms of education costs and foundation formulas and what. But I personally think regional transportation is pretty easy to understand. We need to bus over longer distances and a promise was broken, so fund it. So that's a pretty easy case to make. And we need to, as communities, make sure that on all three levels, because the governor issued his budget, but the House will issue theirs, and then the Senate is the last stop for the train. In the end, they all go into a, a conference committee, the House and the Senate go into a conference committee to hash out that final number. And there is time, there is so much time right now to put that pressure forward and to say, this is the year. And you know, beyond our communities in Triton, you have affinity, brothers and sisters, in Central Mass, down the South Coast, in the Berkshires, I would organize statewide regional school communities. This is the year we make the promise kept. That's what I have to say. Please. Let me first uh, say thank you, Madam Chair, for bringing us all together for this very important issue and obviously to our state auditor for taking time out of your very busy schedule. Uh, you have the utmost respect from the legislators at this table, uh, not only for the report that you did here, but for the numerous reports you've done since you've taken office that have meant so much to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and certainly to our superintendent, who we continue to work on literally on a daily basis. Um, he's got a red line right to our offices, and he doesn't mind using it, <laughs> and he does quite often. And apparently he has a button to an email to all of you, because when he hits that button, we get emails just from uh, just about everybody. What I would like um, to talk about briefly, if I can, is our frustration. And the frustration with the formula, frustration with trying to fund these very important line items, but let's talk about the formula just for a second. This has been a very unfair formula for many, many years. And the frustration that I have, it's, it's a formula that pits suburban versus urban. It pits those with greater means against those with lesser means. And it's a formula that pits freestanding districts against regional school districts. That's what it's come to. And the reason I bring that up to you is because we totally support what you're trying to do here. We offer those amendments, we vote for those amendments, and we get those amendments through, sometimes. The issue that we have, ladies and gentlemen, is the urban versus suburban fight. I have urban legislators who I love and who I respect, who look at regional school districts and say, they can afford those costs. Urban communities cannot. We need to take those dollars that you're fighting for and we need to put them into homelessness in the cities that we represent. We need to take those millions and millions of dollars and we need to put it into opioid problems that we have in our districts. We demand that we have more beds for those who are addicted to opioids. We've addressed that. We have put millions and millions of dollars into those programs. The infrastructure in the Commonwealth is probably at an all-time low right now. As your communities are looking at your infrastructure, the state is looking at its. Our roads and our bridges, our MBTA, our rail service needs to be addressed. And over the last three to five years, we've tried to do that by taking non-bonded funds, cash, and putting it into the NBTA to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. The gang violence that's taking place in some of these cities needed to be addressed. Collectively, we addressed it with millions of dollars. The housing crisis here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We just passed a bond bill yesterday in the Massachusetts House. But along with those bonded funds, we have put cash into those programs. The reason I'm telling you this is because it doesn't leave a lot of discretionary funding left for us to put into these programs that we 
believe should be funded. With that said, the special education cost, all five of us have been working with our colleagues to try and address this by lowering the amount from four times to three times the foundation budget for reimbursement. For or, uh, order for us to do that, I need $150 million. I'll get to how I believe we can do that. The IDAA program for the federal government, it too is not fully funded, despite the fact the legislation says that they will pay for those costs of special education back to the states. With these little caveat, subject to appropriation, they have not kept their promise to the states that they represent for that funding. We have been urging our federal delegation to do something about it. And quite frankly, it's not a Republican holding it up, it's not a Democrat holding up, because both parties have held all three branches at one time over the last 20 years, and they didn't address it. No one did. Those dollars should be flowing from the federal government to the states for reimbursement for SPED costs. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as you know, noticing that we needed to do something created the special education circuit breaker law. We are one of the only states in the nation, only a handful, that do what we do for special education costs to our schools. All five of us want to see that number go from four to three, and we want to ensure that it's always funded at the 75%. And for those of you who saw over the last two to three weeks that that number dropped to 65%, that was because the number that was given to us from DESE did not include the increase to the special education schools. They got an increase uh, and was approved for. We have a supplemental budget coming down the, uh, the lane, and we're going to try and put those dollars back in so that we get that number back to 75%. And from what I'm hearing from my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and both branches, it's something that I believe we can do. We heard you loud and clear, and we're going to address that in this current fiscal year. The Foundation Budget Review. Senator Tarr and I have been working on this review for the last 15 years. We were the original sponsors of the original Foundation Review that took place by DESE about eight years ago. The findings that came out of that report were disgusting. They didn't say anything. And it was sad for us because we were hoping they would come up with some solutions for us. Due to the inaction of that report, Senator Tarr and I continued to work with our colleagues to create a commission, an outside commission, that would look at that formula. And for those of you who are new to this debate and this discussion, the Foundation Review Commission said we need to do a better job with special education funding, it needs to be part of the formula, it really isn't now, and insurance costs need to be part of that formula. In order for us to implement those two changes, we need between 500 and 750 million dollars to pay for those costs. We're looking for those dollars. The health care costs for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, when I first started in the legislature, was 29 percent of our budget. That number is now between 42 and 43 percent. And if you add the cost of insurance for our employees, that number gets up to be close to 50 percent. Again, discretionary funds that aren't available for us to put into programs that all five of us care about. The school choice issue that was brought up is another issue that we have been meeting with the North Shore Superintendent's Roundtable. I'm looking at my superintendent from Manchester, Essex. Thank you for being here. This has been a big issue. Since its inception, it's 5,000 bucks. It has not changed since Education Reform Act of 1993. We have offered amendments to try and get that number to 7,500 and then to $9,000. And what we ask that don't do it all at once, do it over a five-year period. Unfortunately, the leadership of the House and the Senate 
disagreed with that proposal and did not agree to it. We will continue to fight that fight in this year's budget. Now more than ever, that change needs to take place. All five of us are supportive of that. That's the frustration that we have. We continue to fight for you every year, and as was mentioned uh, briefly, but I think very important, when you have a drop in enrollment to the magnitude that we have seen here on the North Shore in our regional school districts, the number you are receiving from Chapter 70 should be considerably less if the formula was put into place. This legislative caucus, the entire North Shore caucus, including Representative Speliotis, said that despite the decrease in population, we are not going to let a school district get less than what they got last year. And if there is an increase per pupil, you will get that, despite the drop in population. We were loud and clear that that needed to take place. And I'm happy to report that continues to be what we're going to do for the upcoming years. And Governor Baker and his uh, proposal suggest to do the same thing. The 100 and few million dollars that the governor put into the Chapter 70, we argue, needs to be higher. We don't think it does the job it should. Like uh, the superintendent mentioned, 100 and a few thousand dollars, and we're only going to get 40,000 something. That's insane. And that is what's wrong with the formula. And that's what needs to be fixed. That you can put over $100 million and only get 40-something thousand. And that's every single regional school district I represent. It's not who represents, it's because of the formula. Doesn't matter who the representative is. That's what's wrong with this formula. We stand united before you to make these changes. And I told you earlier that I have suggestions on how we can pay for this. We just passed gaming legislation here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Plainville is up and running. We soon will have Everett up and running, and Springfield is supposed to open later this year. I would argue to you that that is similar to lottery aid. And if that money which goes to lottery comes back to our cities and towns, 100% after expenses, then gaming should be going into local aid. And that local aid should be education. A few dollars goes into it now by the way the legislation was written. But I would argue to you that those hundreds of millions of dollars that we need for the formula update and special education costs should come from the expanded gaming, which would total, I believe, between five and seven hundred fifty million dollars. We just allowed here in Massachusetts uh, the opening of retail of cannabis. And although many of those dollars will go for prevention and help of those who may be addicted to opioids, there are more dollars that will go right into the general fund. I would argue that some of those dollars could go into these particular items. But I guarantee you, my friends in the urban communities will think that those dollars should be going into the other programs that I spoke to you about. That's the tug of war we have each and every day up on Beacon Hill. And how we can't respect their opinions, uh, they respect ours, and we continue to respect theirs. Respectfully disagree, but we need to do a better job in education. Every report we have received over the last five to ten years has showed we need to make these changes. The question is, how do we pay for it? I believe the dollars are there. Over the last ten years, ladies and gentlemen, we have raised over one billion dollars a year. That's ten billion dollars over ten years that came in in revenues above and beyond what it was ten years ago. Some of those dollars should have gone into these programs. Unfortunately, collectively, the legislature chose not to. That's the frustration. I'll leave you with this. We are advocating on your behalf. We continue to advocate on your behalf. 
And if we can continue this discussion in a group effort like we are tonight, I believe that good things will happen. Thank you for showing up tonight, and I look forward to the comments that you will uh, make to us later in the uh, program. Thank you. If I can just ask, my microphone's on. Briefly, um, if I can just ask any of the other panelists just to make sure you talk really closely to the mic to make sure we can control the reverb. That keeps our tech booth happy. Go ahead. Sure. I just want to first start by thanking everybody for turning out tonight. When I walked into the room, you know, I, I mentioned to the senator and to Representative Mirror uh, what a great turnout uh, this is of folks. Uh, so it just shows the passion and how many people truly care about this issue. You know, when I first started out in public service on the Amesbury City Council, um, you know, we talked about special education costs as being the driver of the, of the school budgets. Over in Amesbury, we're over 60% of our budget goes to the schools. And you know, a large portion of that budget, I think over 20% of that budget uh, is special education costs. Not only do we have a moral obligation uh, to educate all of our students, but we really need to uh, take notice of our special education population and make sure that they get the attention and the very best uh, education uh, because they deserve it just as every, every other student does. But we also need to, as state legislators, uh, understand that communities such as Salisbury and Amesbury are facing uh, a much bigger struggle than communities like Manchester by the Sea or West End, not to pick on you, Brad, I'm sorry. But uh, there are some wealthier communities out there uh, that don't have the population that the communities uh, such as maybe the Triton Regional School District has and uh, districts such as my hometown. So we need to focus in on that. And, and that's why when I first got elected to office, first three out of four bills that I filed had to do with education, regional school bus transportation, and also with uh, special education transportation, and including that in the foundation formula. And I can tell you, as a joint member of the uh, Committee on Education, uh, we are constantly grappling with these issues. Uh, but as you heard before uh, from the minority leader and from Senator Ives, that these, um, these are, it all comes to funding. I mean, you have two columns. You have revenues and expenses. When I first started running for office, I think the state budget was $32 billion uh, back in 2012. It's now $40 billion budget. And just five years alone, we've gone up over a billion, well over a billion dollars a year. I mean, it's, it's a significant increase uh, in revenue, and the funding uh, for other programs is taking precedence. You have 55% of our state budget goes to health and human services. 40% of it goes to uh, funding for Mass Health uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's a big number, folks. Um, so when we're looking at uh, cost items like that in our budget, some other items take a back seat, which is very unfortunate, uh, because we need to be addressing those cost drivers uh, to help make up the gaps and the Triton school budget. Not just only the Triton school budget, but the budgets throughout all the school districts in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And like Representative Hill said, our communities are looked at as, you know, well, you guys, too bad, you can afford it. Well, that's not right. You know, again, Weston shouldn't have to uh, have programs and opportunities available for its students uh, that aren't equal and, or that, that are better than opportunities that are available for students right here uh, in the Triton Regional School District. So rest assured that you've got a lot of folks uh, in the legislature that care passionately about these issues that are working very hard. We see it every day. Every one of us up here, uh, as was indicated before, are working extremely hard to make sure that these resources you know, are available. I spoke with Mr. Valiente on the way in here, and we, and we joked about when he saw me last year uh, when the school committee came to the State House, and you know, we're talking about these big issues, and I know the superintendent and I had this conversation before, but we're all, this is budget season for us. And, and, and I know that when you walk out of here tonight, 20,000 and 30,000 and 10,000 doesn't sound like a lot, but if there are little items you know, within the school uh, budget itself that we can argue for, those nickels and dimes do add up to dollars, um, and those are things that we can get you for you now. Um, so I, I, I'm advocating that all of you out there 
uh, call our offices, email us. If you know of cost items that are going to arise that we can help you with now, I know it doesn't solve a much bigger you know, problem that's out there and that's funding special education and regional school bus transportation. But while we're working on those much bigger, more costly items, reach out to us and say, hey, look it, you know what, we need some computer carts here uh, for the ninth grade students so they can take their MCAS exams uh, like we did over in Amesbury last year. You know, that's $20,000. That's $20,000 that you're not otherwise spending out of the school budget that's not otherwise being derived from property taxpayers uh, here in the school community to fund, that, that can go for funding towards something else. So it adds up over time. Um, you know, we're your best advocates in the, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Reach out to us, use us. It's funny how not a lot of people realize that. We get a number of calls on a regular basis about a broad, or a big variety of issues, whether it's, you know, helping somebody get mass health benefits or uh, city or town get a road paved or, you know, chapter 90 funds, which go for, you know, roads throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, we're here to advocate for you. This is the time for us to help the community uh, in its budget get the money that you deserve so that we can educate the biggest cost item in your budget, which is educating all of our children. I have two school-aged children. I care very much about their education. I want to see them succeed, as all of you do. Uh, so it's important as much to all of us as it is to you. And thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. And uh, thank you again. Is this work? Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. This is a very important conversation. I'm glad so many of you turned out to have it. Uh, it's difficult to add to what's Excuse already. Excuse me, been Representative. Said. Could you just bring that mic closer, please? Is this better? Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming out for this important conversation. Um, I'm glad so many of you turned out to hear it. Uh, I just want to make known that um, it, it's difficult to add to what's already been said. But in addition to fighting for more funding. Uh, we're also working diligently to uh, control our costs as well. There is a bill making its way through the legislature called uh, an act establishing an educational mandate task force. And what this is designed to do is inventory and streamline all the education related administrative rules, regulations, reporting requirements uh, that currently overwhelm uh, professional educators and it detracts from effective teaching. These are uh, mandates that have acquired, been um, implemented over the past several years, several decades, some of which may have outlived their usefulness. And so we're going through them now to hopefully weed out the ones that are not effective in an, uh, in an attempt to try to save costs. So we are working on that end of it as well. And uh, lastly, I'll just add that uh, in addition to the frustrations Rep Hill mentioned, um, I just want to mention tax revenues really haven't kept up uh, to our growing economy. The economy of Massachusetts is doing very well. We have record low unemployment. Um, but instead of a budget surplus at the end of the year, we've been facing budget shortfalls every year. So for the last several years, we've had to make uh, 9C cuts to balance our budgets. Uh, we sincerely hope that ends this year, and we're optimistic. Um, revenues seem to be trending higher, above forecasts, and uh, fortunately we have a governor that realizes we need to uh, in invest that money into education. He's from municipal government. Uh, he understands how it works. And uh, it's my sincere hope that uh, we will be seeing additional revenues uh, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Tarr. Why, thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation to be here tonight. And you know, there's an old saying in politics that it's not that everything hasn't been said, it's just that everyone hasn't had a chance to say it. And I'm going to try to avoid that and not retread some of the, the ground that all of my colleagues have shared because I think it's incredibly important. But I also want to offer my thanks um, to the superintendent and the school committee. Uh, you know, traditionally we hold a meeting of this na nature every year, and it's usually in the library, and it is well attended, but tonight we're actually holding it in an auditorium, and I think that speaks volumes about the interest and the organization and the passion that people have about this issue. And Brian, I, I don't know what you said to get everybody here tonight. I want to learn your secret, but it worked, and I I'm thrilled that you're, uh, you're doing this and pulling us all together. 
I also want to put out uh, a word of thanks, and this was referenced by Representative Hill, uh, to the North Shore Superintendent's Roundtable, because folks may not be aware of the incredible level of organization that our superintendents in the region have, and the dialogue that they have with us on a regular basis to talk about the real issues that are happening in our schools each and every day, and that's incredibly important. I want to say thank you to the superintendents for engaging us in, at that level in conversation, and also the relationship that we have with our superintendents on an individual basis. I think it's extraordinary, not only the amount of communication that happens in this legislative delegation between all of us, but also the, the communication that happens with our local school districts, which is important. I also want to say a, a word of thanks um, to our auditor and to Ben. You know, there have been examples cited, uh, Suzanne, about the work that you've done, and I want to point out one in particular, that it was our state auditor that a couple of years ago now actually took on the task of looking at some of the unfunded mandates that we always talk about as they impact our municipalities, which in turn impact our schools. And it was a series of recommendations that you made uh, that Senator Ives and I have worked on and our colleagues have supported to try to say there are basic things we can do about the unfunded mandates that we always complain about because they siphon parasitically money from the mission of a municipality or of a school district. So you've proven your commitment to really practical things in terms of advice and, and audits. And I'm going to actually make another request of you in just a minute. Um, but I want to thank you for this report as well. The senator is the most prolific requester of the <laughs> my office. You should know that. But he's also really good then at following up in the legislature. And I appreciate that well, too. Well, well, thank you, Madam Auditor. I'm going to, my request will come in a minute. So get your pad ready. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about this report uh, that you've done to me is that identifies some of the long-standing issues that we hear whenever we come out and talk in a regional school district. So really this audit, this report is bringing to a head things that have been coming up all across the state one at a time in a comprehensive way so hopefully we can target our, our sights on it. And one of the things that I read from this report is that unfortunately regional school agreements are becoming viewed as a liability rather than an asset. Right. And that is an unacceptable condition in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Now the second thing that this report does is bring to mind that when we don't pay attention at the 30,000 foot view to things over a long period of time, they begin to go in directions that we don't want them to. Representative Hill mentioned the Foundation Budget Review Commission. And for those of you that have talked about the, this with us in the past, you know that when we originally passed the Foundation or, or the uh, Education Reform Act of 1993, there was supposed to be a periodic review of the Foundation budget to make sure that what we were appropriating matched what we were demanding for performance from our schools. It did not happen. So Representative Hill and I worked and our colleagues have joined us and have been staunch supporters of finally saying, we've got to take a look at this. And what happened when we did? It really just confirmed what people had been saying to us, that the amount of students in special education is completely under-recognized in the foundation budget. And the cost of health insurance is completely under-recognized in the foundation budget. It confirmed it. But realistically, it wasn't anything that a lot of us didn't know. This report will help, I think, to catalyze that same kind of perspective. Because I read through here, Madam Auditor, and I saw something that I think is an incredibly basic but important recommendation. And that is that regional school agreements should be reviewed every five years or in some increment that makes sense so that they're relevant and that there aren't disputes bubbling beneath the surface about an agreement that people start to resent and it winds up dividing the communities that are in the district. A very basic recommendation that I think is critically important. So let me divide things into two categories here for just a minute. So yeah, there are things that cut across every school that we need to do. There is no doubt that we need to fully fund special education and fund the circuit breaker. That cuts across every single school. But there's also something else going on here. And that is we need to look 
at special education and how we're delivering it even more broadly than the circuit breaker. Brad mentioned trying to lower the threshold. The other thing that we're all passionate about is trying to include transportation in the circuit breaker because transportation on an individual basis can be as much money as the tuition for a student to be in a special education program. So we need to look at that. And here's the really irksome thing, is that we as state government say to our school districts, we want you to have inclusion. We want you to bring students with special needs into the school district rather than sending them out of it. And what happens when you do that? What program helps you with that funding? Because we all know it's far easier to reach the threshold for the circuit breaker if you send a student out. Why isn't there a state program to help you with the supports that you need with developing minds early on in educational careers before we get to the point where we might need a costly IEP? Why don't we do that? So that's one of the things that I think we should be looking at. And Madam Auditor, here's my request. I would like to see an audit and a review of the way we deliver special education in Massachusetts to see if we're doing it in the most cost effective and effective ways because it's been a long time since we've taken a look at that. And I personally would like to know, is there room for a program like a supportive program for students that may not be at the circuit breaker level but for whom a very reasonable amount of money can make a world of difference if we step up to the plate and right. provide it. So I'd like to see you do that, and, I, and would be, I'm sure every one of us would support that effort and would work with you to get that done. So we talked just for a moment about some of the things that cut across all school districts, right? We've got uh, certainly uh, the cost of special education and changing the formula so that it adequately reflects that. And we've got the cost of health insurance. If we did those two things, we would help everybody. Now let's talk about regional school issues. So the great promise of regional schools was we were going to be able to get people together and we were going to be able to find economies of scale that were going to make the program worth being involved in. And that's true, and some of that is actually happening. But what I read in the auditor's report is that some of the constraints around regional schools are preventing them from realizing their fullest potential. There's one very basic recommendation in the report that just talks about contracting for transportation with school bus services. I don't know how much that would save, but I bet it wouldn't be insignificant. But what I'm talking about is something else. In addition to that, why aren't we looking at, are there different ways that we can free up regional schools by providing the kind of grants and incentives that are mentioned in this report to say, if you do something innovative, we're going to help you do that rather than just hope you can do it with some funds you can scrounge up, whatever's left at the end of the day, which we know usually isn't much. So why wouldn't we look at making that kind of an investment in addition to fully funding regional school transportation so that we can say to regional school districts, okay, wait a minute, number one, we're going to make sure that your regional school agreement is reviewed periodically so that it's relevant and current because we know what happens when we don't review things. We wind up with a foundation budget that's over a billion dollars out of whack and we wind up with a situation where we don't fully fund to the extent that we should things like special education. Okay, why aren't we looking at regional school agreements and along the way saying can they be the catalyst for innovation in terms of how we might pool resources together for special education or for talented and gifted students in a way that regionals have a particular capability to do. So why aren't we as state government saying okay, let's, let's make, meet the commitment we already have, and then let's find ways to take advantage of the special qualities that regional school districts have. Because personally, I don't think we're doing that to the fullest extent. So those are the two categories of, of things that um, I think we could go in a direction that would make sense on. And the last thing I'll leave you with is kind of a sense of timing. Because 
we have these conversations a lot. Dan Valiente, you and I have been having these conversations since you were a state representative. And oftentimes, the glory days, oftentimes we talk about the fact that to do any of these things, we need to have some additional money, right? Here's a, here's a reality with regard to Chapter 70. The formula is unfair. It treats similar communities differently, and it should be reformed. But here's another reality. You're never going to change the formula unless you can hold everyone harmless and then give the people that have been shortchanged some additional money, and that takes money. So for the last few years, we've been saying, well, we just don't have that kind of money. But now, and this is why this re report, Madam Auditor, is important, is because of its timing. You have a situation where has been referenced up here already. You have gaming money, some of it already designated in a nonspecific way for education. You also have, hopefully, some of the benefit of an economic recovery that up until now hasn't been demonstrating to us the second part of an economic recovery, which is wage growth. We've had phenomenal growth in employment, but you haven't had huge increases in state tax revenue because we haven't had wage growth. Now we're starting to see that. So here's what I said, and I apologize for my colleagues for being redundant because they heard me say this the other day at the superintendent's roundtable. I think we need to now focus on the fact that an opportunity is coming our way that rarely comes, where we may have some additional discretionary resources. And I don't think we can wait to say, we'll see how that goes in terms of where the money goes. I think we need a list, and it needs to be a short list, and we need to say, this is what we're going to do, and we're not going to retreat from it. And first on that list, needs to be things that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has committed to and not met its commitment. Regional school transportation, special education, the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission. This, in this particular climate, right now, is not an academic exercise. You can bet on Beacon Hill, because it is our obligation, but it's also our nature, that people are reading the numbers. They are seeing that we are $740, $750 million above benchmark. And I guarantee you, if you put them all together, there are probably thoughts of how to spend that to the tune of 30 or $40 million, right? But here's the thing. We've got to come with a list that is the, the common denominator. And we've got to say, before we think about any other ways to spend that money, any of the flashy, new, innovative things that will get a lot of attention, a lot of splash in the newspapers, we've got to pay for the basics we've committed to. And that's where I think... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and that's where I think this year can be different. We've got a great report here. We've got the review of the Foundation Budget Review Commission, and we have the stars lining up to have some money to do things. Will it be enough for everything we want to do? No, it won't. But we will have missed an opportunity if we chase new horizons for new programs and different spending, and we don't meet the commitments that we've made. So my request is twofold up here tonight. And I obviously am happy to work with everybody, and we have an incredible legislative delegation. And le let me just say, when it comes to these issues, there is no party. There are only constituents and a common obligation to serve them. So I hope that we'll come up with our short list. I hope that we'll begin organizing on how to get it passed. I hope the auditor will help us look at special education. And I hope that we'll say that not only are we going to find some funding, but we're going to start a new paradigm. And that new paradigm is we don't let things go 20 years before they're looked at to see if they're still working. So that we set up a structural change such that we don't get into these places that we all lament so much ever again. That's why this discussion is really important. 
and I'm really honored to be part of it. And I apologize for being a little bit of long-winded, but you know, this for me is therapy too. <laughs> and I just appreciate you all being here and being able to be part of the conversation. Thank you. Testing? Yes, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, with your uh, permission, I'd love to, because I didn't know the full time frame that we all had to speak being the first speaker, but um, you know, to follow up on what Senator Tarr said, if Auditor Bump is taking notes about requests, um, I couldn't agree with Senator Tarr more. And what is frustrating uh, to coin uh, Representative Hill the frustration also comes from special education costs are growing and what's frustrating is you see in the budget if you look at it early intervention is really considered a boutique line item and it's really the key way we're going to contain special education costs so I would also request that that issue of a lack of consistent investment in early intervention as part of the real remedy to curb special education costs and most importantly than any cost is to help our students address any issues as early as possible for successful robust education and a love of learning as soon as possible um, it's very frustrating to see that we're really just just giving a pittance to what could be part of a really robust long-term solution for addressing issues where if they're allowed to languish become something that might actually change the direction of a child's life so I would make that request as well thank you all at this point I would like to ask if any of our town officials have any questions or comments for our panel please go to the microphone and again state your name your hometown and what your role is please yeah my name is David Peterson I'm a selectman in the town of Raleigh and I would like to change the focus a little bit from the broad educational issues that you people have been dealing with and change that focus to the ability of the cities and towns to pay their share of school costs with these skyrocketing costs that have taken place I live in a small town Raleigh the 6,000 people I've been a selectman since the early 90s, off and on, a number of years. Uh, our ability to fund our obligation to the regional school has become severely taxed. And I, as you look at what the superintendent put together in terms of state aid for the schools, I wish I had the same chart for state aid, cherry sheet aid to the cities and towns, because it would look exactly the same. Whatever we were getting in 2002, we're getting less in 2017, 2018. We're strapped because we're, our ability to raise funds. We're allowed to raise 2.5% increase on last year's property taxes. We're allowed to have new growth. Some years we have pretty good new growth, other years we don't have much. Some communities have a the ability to create a lot of new growth, other, people, other communities don't, and I think that exists in, within the regional district here. It's very frustrating uh, the way the formula, the Chapter 70 formula works, and Superintendent Forget has talked about it every year. The communities we get involved, we have the fights over funding for our, you know, doing our share of these regional school budgets. The ability of the town to pay is in Raleigh's particular case has been taxed due to the formula and the change in student population and so on and so forth in the last three fiscal years 2018 17 and 16 Rowley has increased its payments its assessment to, to Triton regional school system in a three-year period has increased by 1.2 million dollars our ability to raise new funds each year is about four hundred thousand dollars total we try to split that 50% for the town. We have our health care costs and so on and so forth, just like the school does. That gives us $200,000, $250,000 to give to Triton. That means in the last three years, we've, we've raised our portion, that what we consider our portion to Triton is $600,000, a little bit more. We're actually paying Triton, we've actually paid Triton 1.2 million dollars that's put 
a severe taxing on municipal services to come up with that funding. All that extra funding comes out of our free cash. As any of us that deal with budgets know, when you're taking operating expenses out of free cash, the well runs dry very quickly. The superintendent and the school district was, gave us a sheet a month or so ago that indicated that between contract costs, health insurance costs, and special ed costs, before they do a nickel to any other educational programs, they're anticipating a $2 million increase to Triton's budget. We can't afford to fund that. If you split that three by three by three, that's another six or $700,000 we're expected to come up with this year. That will totally strip our free cash, plus it may well result in having to cut programs, either employees in the fire, police, highway department, reduce the library, services to fund the school budget. We, we, we don't want to do that, but what choice are we going to have? If we don't face that this year, I guarantee that the way things are going, we're going to be facing that problem next year. Back in the early 90s, when you mentioned a couple of times about how the funding formula was originally put together, there was a pothole fund created. Because when that group put together that formula, they realized that communities, certain communities, were going to have a difficult time coming up with funding and I know Raleigh got, my mind's getting a little shaky, but I know at least one year we got some money out of that pothole fund to get us out of a hole, to keep us solvent. And I believe either Salisbury or Newbury, maybe both, also benefited in those first few years. I would like to see some amount of few million dollars put into this pothole fund, and I'm sure other communities are in the same boat as Raleigh. I don't know where I'm going to get the money other than to lay people off. So that if we could do that, I think that would be really valuable. And it would be a relatively small amount of money, but it would help some communities like ours to, to fund for a year or two the increased school costs until all these other programs hopefully can take effect. The second driver and one of the big ones that Superintendent Fortune gives us is, and we've, everybody's talked about it, is special education. To me, and, and my wife has spent 25 years in the school committee here, I've been heavily involved as a selectman with the school budgets. This circuit breaker thing is a joke. It's an absolute joke. All it is is a way to say, oh yeah, we're putting some money into special education. I would like to see something along the lines of, if we spend $10,000 a year per pupil in the Triton District, and I'm pulling that amount out of the school, out of the sky, I don't know exactly what it is. Then for special ed, maybe we pay twice that, and the state picks up anything more than that. Because in this year's budget alone, the superintendent has told us that we're going to have an increase of 500, half a million dollars in the special ed budget for kids moving into our district. And there's been articles in the paper about kids moving in, kids moving out. Yes, we have an obligation to fund it. But some of these people, I don't know if they pick communities, or maybe it's a it, I, I don't know how the, the, it fluctuates on such a wide basis from year to year on special education. But I think it's an absolute must that, you know, we, we fund, we'll fund extra money. We want to help these kids. But when you're, some of these kids are requiring two and $300,000 for one student to be educated, uh, and, and Raleigh and, and, and Salisbury and Newbury, we can't afford that, not with everything else that's going up. So I'll leave you with that, but just keep in mind that in the cities and towns, we're limited in how we raise money. We need help. We, we, we love our schools. We want to fund you. And I think the superintendent and the chairman of the school, chairperson of the school committee can fund it. We've been, Raleigh and the three communities have been excellent about funding whatever we can. We're, we, we now have our backs against the wall. And we just hate every single year to have all the town services pitted against the school. So please, help us. If you can set up a pothole fund of some sort as a, sh a short-term solution, it would really be appreciated. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Joe? Joe Perry. Chairman of the Board of Selectmen in Raleigh, and Joe, I'm also. Could you just tilt that down a little bit? I'm also chairman of the uh, Pine Grove School Renovation Committee. It's not that we haven't asked a lot of our taxpayers in Raleigh. We have last year at budget season, we were preparing to uh, for an override of 39 million dollars to renovate the Pine Grove Elementary School. The taxpayers 
were appreciative and they supported that. Taxpayers, senior citizens like myself, came up to me and they said they were happy to support the renovation because they knew Pine Grove needed a lot of work. But they also came up to me and they said that they were very willing to vote down the budget increase for the Triton Regional because we couldn't afford it. And, they, and that's the message that I got from a lot of seniors. We can't afford that increase and we need some help. Thank you, Joe. Any other town officials like to address our legislators? Hi, I'm Alicia Greco, and I'm on the Board of Selectmen in Newberry. Um, I'm going to echo Raleigh's um, comments about this graph. This worries me immensely. If the Commonwealth does not, I know Chapter 70 and splitting up the formula is difficult and is, there's got, we need to find another way ar around it because this is not sustainable. It's not sustainable to our children, our schools, and our towns. And I just, it, this is very worrisome to me. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Yes. Can't see, sorry. <laughs> takes, takes me a while to get the microphone now. Um, one thing is, it's been articulated pretty heavily by some of the selectmen that the needs to balance education, public safety, and all the other things that towns face is very important. But really, when you think of that, you've got to go back to the fact that, especially in the town of Newbury and all the other towns, you know, our fire engines were old. You know, our buildings were dilapidated. We were in the red in 2006 and 7. Thank God Tracy Blaze came. So, you know, we're working as hard as we can to try to play catch up for the town of Newbury. We have very little commercial component within our uh, budgeting process and we've got a lot of old stuff so everything is balanced so when we talk about the towns you know you start to go down in the layers and the layers of cement floors buckling in fire stations and equipment being 1986 and police stations working in mold so those are the things that we all battle you know on the town level to balance education public safety and all the other things thanks Thank you. Just as a reminder, um, that last speaker with, was Jeff Walker, chair, or, uh, Selectman from the Board of Newberry. Speakers, please identify yourself. Next speaker, please. Mm -hmm. Good evening. I'm Chuck Takesian, a uh, member of the Board of Selectmen from Salisbury. And first off, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight, especially uh, our state auditor, who I'm sure is very busy. Uh, she's got a whole state to cover. Uh, you guys just have a little district. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, uh, when I first ran for Selectman 100 years ago, it was actually 20, probably 25 years ago, um, I was asked what my long term, what a long term objective or what I wanted to see in the long term. And now this was 1989. So I said, I'd like to see a Salisbury High School. And as you know, we went the other way. We went uh, we were not fully regionalized then. We went full regionalization because the state, as a, you know, we were told over and over again, held that carrot out to us that, oh, if you regionalize, we will take care of uh, special education, we will take care of uh, uh, transportation, and over and over. And that carrot got farther and farther away. And just, I want to take the sentiments of, of Selectman Peterson. We don't have a lot of ways to raise money in the towns. We're constrained by two and a half uh, and what, what, what growth we have. And um, fortunately for us, uh, we have had some good growth, but not enough to cover um, what, what we expect um, our school budget to be. So thank you for being here tonight. And I hope we're going to hold you to that, to those promises that you made tonight. Um, and I think you will because you're, you're a bunch of great people. So thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Chuck. Yes. Hi, Annie Cameron Essex. I'm on the Manchester Essex Regional School Committee. Um, first, I want to just say I, it's important not to pit communities against one another. Um, Essex is not, um, doesn't have some same wealth that Manchester has, but when you come for us, we're going to stand together. So um, my question to you is you're advocates for us, but you're also politicians. And I'm wondering what horse trading you can do to get some of these things done. I mean, you've been working on this for quite a while. What can you do to, to make it happen? Because we've just seen a really disappointing weekend in Washington where people didn't negotiate very well. So um, what can you do to get what we need done? Hold it closer, please. It. How's that? There you go. Um, I'm actually very proud of the fact that uh, this delegation works very well together in a bipartisan manner. And we've actually accomplished quite a bit over the last five years in bringing more education funding to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And uh, the five of us have put our names on things that have actually been adopted. And a couple of us have actually been the lead sponsors of those initiatives. I heard one of my selectmen talk about the pothole account. That account had been zeroed out over the last few years. And I'm happy to report with the bipartisan efforts of this group, we were able to put $2 million into that account this fiscal year to help with our communities and our districts who do find a bump in their uh, fiscal year that we're able to help. And that money, I hope, will be increased. It was two of us, actually, up here who initiated the Foundation Review Commission. It took about five years for that to happen. That's the way the legislature works, unfortunately. But we were able to put that Foundation Review Commission together, working in a bipartisan manner with our leadership to get that done, because we were as loud as we could be to say there's a problem with this foundation budget and it needs to be fixed, but we need something on paper to show us that one, there is an issue that we think exists, we proved it, and two, what do we need to do to get it fixed? Chairman Peich, who has been wonderful um, as the House Chair, and I'll let the Senate talk about the Senate Chair in just a few minutes, she has been one of our biggest advocates, and she actually came out just today and said as we move forward this fiscal year, we need to do a better job of funding education. That was done in a bipartisan manner. So the, because of the lack of funds, that is what's kept us from being able to do what we wanted to do. Senator Tyr and I identified close to a billion dollars of discretionary funding that will now be available for this upcoming fiscal year. Because those dollars are available now, I'm confident that not all, but a lot of what we are talking about tonight we'll finally start seeing some funds. Will it happen all in one year? No. Will we be able to phase it in like we did the special education circuit breaker? I believe we can. So to answer your question, we have proven over the last five to six years that it doesn't matter what party you in, party you are in, we can work all together to get things done for education. Has it been at a snail pace? Yes, it has, because of lack of funding. Now that there's some funding available, those discussions are going to take place, and they're going to take place in a very loud and clear way uh, in the next two fiscal years. Thank you. I'd like, to, I'd like to also add that, like Senator Tarr said, one of the challenges that we see like a broken record is the regional dispute, so that those communities that benefit from the status quo, especially, and I know that you can appreciate this, especially if they're in leadership, have that ability to just put the brakes on versus those communities that don't benefit from the status quo. That's part of the intractability. And that's why it's so important because we're hemmed into this chapter 70 funding formula, which by the way, I take issue that it is just so complicated as a baseline. If it's so complicated that the average parent or the average legislator does not understand it and only experts do, I think by default it's broken because how can you reform something that's almost incomprehensible? So it needs to be simplified as well. But because we, we are, are you know, doing the same kind of dance year in and year out, 
on that issue of revenue, like Senator Tarr said, we do have some unique opportunities that don't happen very often in the area of gaming and marijuana. So there are plenty of downsides to that, and a lot of people, like myself, I wasn't in the legislature when gaming was approved, but at least we should be able to solve some really tangible problems if we don't like that it's there at all. So we do need to be assertive in that because if we don't organize and say it needs to be earmarked for these causes, then it's definitely going to either be earmarked for something else or it will be with the whim of the preference of the person that happens to be in power at that time or the region that happens to be um, dominating leadership. So I do think that it's going to be really important to say we need to earmark those funds for education because that's the only way, like Senator Tarr said, to hold people harmless is for there to be more money in general to be distributed. So I feel like the, the time is so critical to seize that and make sure that we're able to do that because to, to deal with a formula where folks that either are just innately more wealthy um, and don't need it so critically or benefit um, because the inverse, they're incredibly needy communities, then we're just going to have legislators pitted against one another either because they're regional or um, municipally based um, or like someone in the audience said, we're going to unfortunately be pitting town versus um, school district and, and that is very destabilizing and I think there is actual tangible work to be done to say um, through the Cannabis Commission and the Gaming Commission, we need to move forward quickly um, and get that locked in so that we can actually figure out, it's not just education, education itself has to be broken down to figure out where the needs are and how we can get around some of the longer term solutions that require a legislative fix. So I think that's really where I would personally focus my energy is the new revenue that's coming down the pike while the Chapter 70 issue is being fought over year in and year out and year in because we need more money overall no matter what that formula is. That's the, the most basic thing. And one other thing in terms of I think a uh, potential for new revenue that isn't necessarily talked about and that is the revenue that's actually left on the table and not taxed year after year after year under the category of corporate tax credits. And it gets a little bit of a uh, a downplay and it's to the tune of billions of dollars not millions of dollars of corporations that currently have tax credits and those are taxes they don't have to pay and that's okay if it has a benefit to the public but I think our state could do a better job of paying attention to make sure that those corporations are fulfilling the promises that they said they would keep in order to get those tax credits initially such as retaining and growing jobs so a lot of those tax credits don't have any sunset provisions new ones do and we're talking about billions of dollars that could actually be fresh revenue that's not coming from our municipal residents. So thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask if there's anybody in the general audience that would like to pose a question. Or Alicia. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming here and listening to us. Um, as I'm going to speak for the school committee, as school committee members and as members of municipal governments, what can we do to help you mm -hmm. help us? Mm -hmm. Because I am willing to, you know, email, talk, call. I, I know you five are very well intended, and I know you can't do it alone. And I know, like just what I've been hearing you loud and clear, leadership is leadership, and um, big cities have you know clout and blah blah blah. But anything that we can do to help you, please tell us. Just continue to communicate. Well, I, I, I'd like to take a crack at that actually myself, um, uh, and, and take you guys off the hook for a second. Um, is that so? If you are a member of your school committee, then um, I'm assuming you're also a member of the association of school committees. Oh, okay. I, I'm sorry. We have school committee on this side. Okay. Well, but even as a member of the uh, the board of selectmen, um, I'm assuming you're then you're members of the Massachusetts Municipal Association, and so the MMA, like the Association of School Committees. Um, supports the uh, the efforts to get additional funding 
for regional school transportation and for um, and for special ed. I and that's I uh, and that's great. But what you need to do is use your power within those organizations to put that not just on the wish list, but at the top of the wish list. You know, claim your space within your organizations to get to bring your concerns to the top of their list. Because the reality is that the the population is in metropolitan Boston, and so that's where the political power is. And if they're not experiencing um, these same pressures that that you are, you know, they can give lip service to your issue, but they're not going to put it at the top of the the ask list when they are lobbying um, these legislators and the legislative leadership. You want to make sure that they prioritize your issues this this year. And that's, that's one of the things that you can do within those organizations. And really, it applies to, um, to the general public um, as well. You've already heard that your legislative delegation is on your side. So you don't need to call them anymore. But you could write a letter to the Speaker of the House or to the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and let them, let them know that you have a voice um, too, and that they have an obligation to hear your voices, uh, as well as as these legislators have an obligation to hear your voices. So, um, so use use your and and use your outside voices. Don't be afraid. You don't you don't have to just stick to your inside voices. Use your outside voices every every once in a while, um, and uh, and and make sure um, that they are that they really resonate through the halls of uh, a Beacon Hill. Thank you. I would just like to add, and you bring up an important point, uh, Ms. Bump. We do involve ourselves with our, our, right. state, our state organizations. In fact, Joan Peterson, who is here, here, here tonight, and gave you a copy of the bus that we used, yes. how many years ago, Joan? 2008. From 2008. Joan got me involved with the, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, Regional Schools uh, Committee, yeah. And Ellen Holmes, I don't know if she's still here, is, is our chairperson and has been very active, which I'm sure our representatives up here, being part of the regional caucus, are familiar with her name because that is a very active group. But it takes more than just that. I agree with you, we need the general public. Our committee, I am very pleased to say, has, has taken on a very strong advocacy um, goal this year as one of our school committee goals. And after this forum is done, our next step is to help involve our general public in a letter writing campaign. Okay. Now, I know people sometimes think that isn't effective, but it is. somebody had asked her, I believe it was Representative Kelcor, said, keep communicating. Well, you will certainly be hearing from Triton. Good. 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 Um, if I may, the other thing is, um, I know that you had said that we're all politicians, but we're also all campaigners as well. So um, that's uh, a toolkit we have as well. And I, I have to also uh, suggest that because you know that we're listening, if you have friends or family that live in different districts, they have different senators and different representatives. So if you have shared issues of concern about these topics, then please ask them to write to their senators and their reps, because for better or for worse, we, we focus on our own constituents. So I'm gonna focus on my constituents and my colleague who represents another district will focus on theirs. So if you have relatives in other regional school districts or friends or, or colleagues in the workplace, ask them to write to their own respective legislators. That will be extremely helpful. Ms. Choate. Uh, Deborah Choate, Triton Regional School Committee. A couple of things, one of them is, is uh, fairly minor, but I did want to make note of it. I think that grants are a wonderful thing, and um, it was a great suggestion, but that can't be what we look for as a fix going forward by any stretch of the imagination. The other thing that I haven't heard mentioned tonight is funding for charter schools. Our governor was a huge supporter of charter schools. 
And I don't think anybody on the school committee has anything against charter schools. What we have a problem with is the way the charter schools are funded because uh, <laughs> charter schools take funding away from other schools, which from us and from other non-charter schools, and makes our struggle even harder. And um, so I, I think that's a huge issue, the amount of money that goes to charter schools. No problem with charter schools, they need to be funded differently. Okay. Thank you, Deb. Is there anybody else who would have liked, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dale Williams Newbery, uh, parent of two recent graduates of Triton. Uh, just uh, to address the uh, circuit breaker for special ed, I really think when you look at some students in the district and probably all other districts, some of our students in SPED are costing 100, 200, 300, up to $400,000 per student. This is, in many respects, a health care issue, not an education issue. So possibly the approach for the circuit breaker should be based on uh, we are really covering medical services for some of these students. In fact, they're taking probably up the biggest part of the budget. We need to shift those costs away from the cities and towns who could really be burdened by just a few students moving in the districts to the health care system, Medicaid, or one of, uh, even though that's 40% of the budget already. But if we could shift the cost from the local communities in a district away from that budget to the state budget where the state, the entire state is covering these students who really add to the cost. Uh, second point, uh, I think the state auditor, and thank you for coming tonight, I think you have the biggest job in the state. We are a very wealthy state. We're number one in education across the country by many metrics. So it's not that we don't have enough money to educate our kids. We're just not getting the value for the money we're spending in many respects. So I think your job by coming here tonight just got a lot bigger because there is a lot of money being spent on education. I'm not sure we're getting the value for the dollars spent. Uh, third point, I agree with the selectman from Rowley. You put these towns in a bind. You, you, on the one hand, put a prop two and a half on them where they can't raise their budgets without their residents voting for the only tax increase in the state that they can vote down. So it puts the towns in an impossible situation. Uh, I don't have a solution for that, but I think we need to review Prop 2 and a half as well, especially as it relates to the education costs in these towns because it's more than 50% of the budget, and it wasn't that way years ago. But my last point uh, is really everyone in this panel supports almost everything we're here to discuss. So the problem isn't here. The problem is at the top. The leadership at the top of Massachusetts whether it be the governor or the House or the Senate, some are Republicans, some are Democrats, there's a lack of leadership at the top. People are spinning their wheels here. And I'm not saying you're doing it needlessly. You're doing hard work, but we're not getting the support from the top. And I don't, I don't have a solution for that except kind of throw the bums out. Let's try someone else. <laughs> Uh, and my last point is I'd love to see license plates in Massachusetts. Our new slogan, Massachusetts, a state for education. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to, uh, to, uh, to comment on, on one of the points that a couple of speakers now have, uh, have made. I was talking uh, earlier about the idea of, of piloting different ways of paying uh, for this. And one of the things that I, I think it was, I think it was Pennsylvania, um, where they, uh, they uh, and many other states, um, that have uh, assessments to support the regional school districts rather than have it paid for through the property tax. So it takes it out of competition for the 
uh, for the services because it is really, it's, it's funded separately. You get billed separately. You have to put in your same, you know, your, um, your accountability measures, and I'm sure you're going to want to put in some, um, some breaks on, on growth as well. But if you, if you fund it, if you take it off the property tax and move to an assessment, then it's not in that it, it's not in competition. There, it's, uh, I'm going to let Ben, who seems, I can see out of the corner of my eye, wants to, uh, to add, add some, uh, some more intelligent detail to what I'm, <laughs> to what I'm talking about here. Uh, so, in the rest of the country, they, we deal with um, regionalizing schools in different ways. There are some states, obviously, that do it on a countywide basis as a little kid for instance, I spent some time living in Montgomery County, Maryland, it's a giant county, suburban DC, they have a school department. They run the schools in the county, same way in Florida, many other states do it on a countywide basis. Um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, other states do regional schools, to the auditor's point, as a separate municipal entity. So they have their own power of taxation as well as um, budget approval. So they have elected school boards uh, or boards of education, and they're called in some places, uh, and they have to live under their version of Prop Two and a Half. So they they have restrictions on property tax revenue then. But um, to the point that the auditor was making, then the municipal officials and the education officials are not in competition. They have their own separate revenue sources, um, their own budgeting um, and um, spending authority, uh, and just like here, if they want to go past the limit, they have to then go out to the voters and have them vote for a higher tax levy um, than would be allowable um, under the law. Um, so, you know, and that's something we point out in the report and say that, hey, there might be some school districts out there somewhere, one or more, that might be interested in working on a, a pilot um, on this ki kind of issue. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment, comment on um, was Dale from Newberry's point about um, Medicaid costs. Um, there actually used to be a much more significant uh, contribution from the federal government uh, for uh, education expenses in, in this area through Medicaid. And I know in my town, because I've stared at their budgets for the last 15 years, um, we were getting five, six hundred thousand dollars a year for quite a long period of time in Medicaid reimbursement um, against. Um, some of the um, higher special ed costs um, related to outplacement. And this year it's down to about $100,000. Um, so, um, you know, that commitment is a federal issue um, that um, uh, has been backed off on, that um, has moved expenses um, back to the state. Due to the lateness of the hour, I am going to ask our superintendent. Uh, he had some questions he wanted to ask. I have, I have one question, very brief. Um, I was actually speaking, I believe it was uh, Senator Ives who was speaking about um, the timing. And so there's the issue of Chapter 70, there's the issue of all these funding uh, needs that we have, but uh, another unique challenge for a region is the fact that we have to have our budget finalized by March 15th to certify to the towns. We're actually rather late compared to other regions, even in our area, uh, that have to certify it to the towns as early as December, January, February. Uh, when, when we can't count on the right numbers in the governor's budget, we then have to guess. So we obviously need to guess conservatively so we don't end ourselves in a, in a back and forth that, that's not good for anyone, especially the students. So in years past, there has been some joint resolutions. There hasn't been in recent years, so my question is, is that uh, an option that's on the table? And if not, why hasn't that been a discussion to have a, uh, an early joint resolution on, on local and, and Chapter 78 uh, so we can get a number, I would say for Triton, as early, you know, as February, March, and for other regions, as soon as possible? So I'll take the first stab at that if it's okay. And, and I've always been a um, huge fan of early local aid resolutions and getting them passed because I think they provide you uh, with important information because of the uh, discrepancy in timing between budgets. Here's the problem from my perspective, is that the concept of an early local aid resolution over the last several years has changed. 
And historically, when I and others have filed them, they have set forth minimum amounts of aid upon which we could build. But more recently, the approach has been taken by the legislative leadership that those will certify maximum amounts as well. And so you can understand why legislators would be hesitant to pursue them because they'd be locking in an amount, in fact, and I'll let the House members speak for this, but my understanding is that oftentimes preliminary actions before the House gets into the budget actually take those kind of amendments off the table. So it, it's the, the tool has changed. And, and I would argue not in a very good way. Um, I actually have tried to offer rules changes and will probably pursue that again uh, in the future when we create new rules again for the House and the Senate to require that we pass an early local aid resolution by a date certain. Now obviously you can deviate from it. You, you wouldn't be naive enough to expect that we will add something in stone knowing that things can change. But at least if we could say these are the minimum amounts that you will get, then you would have that in hand knowing that if things get better, then perhaps uh, we can add some money to that. And here's the other issue, and Senator Ives and I were talking about this a little bit, and that is that historically, one of the issues that we really need to communicate about is that when the House writes its budget, it doesn't have as many months of data as we do. So oftentimes the House, by virtue of that, must be more conservative because they can't be as confident in the revenue numbers that they have. Oftentimes the Senate adds more money because we're later in the cycle and we know we have a better set of information about where the economy is headed, where our tax revenues are at. So we sometimes come in with a higher number and then obviously we go to conference and we try to negotiate it out. Now the reverse of that is true if revenues are declining because then we have to be the bad guy and we will come in with a lower number. But having some baseline uh, I think is a good idea, but it is very difficult to pursue if the rules are going to be that that limits what we can do in the budget to try to change it. Yeah, as long as it doesn't preclude an amendment, it would be a no-brainer. So that's something that we can explore on yeah. the Senate side. And I'll speak on behalf of the House side. Uh, the, the Republican caucus has offered this every single year. Uh, we too have tried to change the rules that you are to get your numbers by a certain date uh, every year, usually in March 15th is what we aim for. Uh, the House leadership has chosen not to adopt those rules changes. Uh, we offer an early resolution every year. The House leadership uh, declines to let it move forward. Uh, so I would recommend after some of the conversations that we've had today that if this is something that's important to the superintendents as well as our community leaders, this would be the opportunity to start advocating with your groups, the superintendents and the MMA, to the House leadership and say we need to have these numbers because in our case, it's a town meeting vote which takes place in the spring, which is very different from a city form of government which gets their vote later in the year. So I would urge you to reach out to your associations and reach out to the House and Senate leadership and say this is something very important to us this year. Excellent. Thank you. I would like to thank all of our state officials and our state auditor, and Dr. Tafoya, for coming here tonight. The report is of great value to all of us who are in regional districts, and I appreciate your work on it and your presentation here tonight. I'd also like to thank everybody who came out here tonight. We had a great crowd, and we really appreciate your participation in this forum. Thank you again for coming, and have a great night.